Hello, BookTube. That well-known BookTube troublemaker David Wiley came up with a video concept last year called Bookshelf Essentials, where you look at all the books on your shelves. Oh my God, I'm looking at a thousand of them right now. And some, when you do that, invariably, some of those books will jump out over others. Some of them will be will feel more essential than others. I'm not sure how willing you'd be to get rid of all the others, but nevertheless, some will strike you that way. And uh, David Wiley's idea was take those books down off the shelf and talk about them a bit. That's a wonderful idea. I love it. So I've been doing quite a few bookshelf essentials. I think I will probably spend the rest of the year doing bookshelf essentials. And I have one now, a little bit odd, a little bit dorky. Uh, this is this is from uh, 1966. Uh, and it's part of a set that once upon a time I had the whole set. Uh, I obviously didn't have it in the 1960s since that was long, long, long before I was born. But I did have the whole set, and I really wish I still did. They really are adorable. Uh, the series was uh, Our Living World of Nature. And I once had the whole thing. I had a whole shelf of them. Don't I also had uh, Time Life books, the whole of the Time Life books. I wish I still had them all, uh, even though a lot of the information is outdated. Fortunately, this volume, this is by Bill Nearing, who knew this subject backwards and forwards. And the subject here really doesn't go out of date. Uh, this is the, the life of the marsh. <laughs> See, this is the kind of book I'm talking about. These these uh, are heavily illustrated hardcovers. You've got the understated but still lovely end papers here for the marsh. Reeds reflected in the water. And you have uh, artwork in here as well that will show you the schematics of whatever subject is involved here. There are a whole bunch of subjects. I think the reason that I still have this one is because it's my favorite. Uh, marshes are wonderful, were once upon a time a wonderful magnet for me when I traveled. I love, uh, especially saltwater marshes, but marshes of any kind, I love exploring them. Uh, provided I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did not have crocodiles or alligators. <laughs> if, if, I'm in an area with with calm, picturesque water, a lake or an inlet of some kind, and I think there's a 15-foot ambush predator with an unbreakable jaw waiting an inch below the water to grab me faster than I can get away, then I'm not going to love that area. But the, the saltwater marshes along the eastern seacoast of the United States, mm, they were a bit tricky to explore when you have a canoe full of beagles, but I managed to do it. They're also uh, very evocative, but also very creepy uh, to overnight in. And I've done that as well. And it, it can get weird. They are full of life uh, that you don't see when you're driving past them on the highway or even when you're canoeing the suit through the, the normal little bits and pieces of the channels, you know, with a guide during the day. Uh, fi hauling out on an island in the middle of a marsh and spending the night is a weird experience. But I've done it, and I've loved it. I love the ecology of marshes. I love the, this, the weird beauty of them. And this book captures all of that. Uh, you get uh, tons and tons of beautiful photos all throughout. And you get those uh, diagrams that show you... You also get uh, archival photos as well of marsh because marshes are forever changing uh all all uh riverine elements are forever changing but marshes are forever changing you they will enlarge if uh, if a certain group of people gets involved with them they might shrink uh they have they might uh, sediment up uh and they also freeze oh my god it's a spider killing a, a fish <laughs> you can find all sorts see here you go you get you get sequential guidelines like this as to the cycle of life. Nearing is very very big in this book on the cycle of life. Look at that. There's a saltwater marsh. How lovely. Uh, I used to spend endless amounts of time just going off everywhere in a saltwater marsh and exploring them all. As long as I was sure there were no crocodilians involved, I was perfectly honest. okay to spend huge amounts of time there. The the uh, there are two drawbacks, especially if you're in a canoe with a bunch of beagles. I never actually explored marshes of any kind, especially saltwater marshes, with other humans. They're a pain in the neck anyway to travel with, but in this area, in this environment, no, it's going to ruin your time. The, the two main drawbacks here are, one, 
it's very easy to get stuck sucking mud real real expanses of mud so portage is really hard and also camping is really hard and also bugs oh my god <laughs> oh my god biting bugs widges and midges and flies and mosquitoes and whatnot just <laughs> but i've also done a huge amount of travel of salt marshes uh in winter which is it just added the surreal element is just added to because marshes and ponds tend to freeze over in the winter or at least once upon a time they did uh and nearing the author of this book was an expert on salt on marshes of all kinds and ponds and pond environments of all kinds and he just takes he takes the approach in this book that the whole living world of nature series takes which is Yes, it's a heavily illustrated book. It's clearly meant to be in a set. It's clearly meant to be on a shelf or on a coffee table when guests come over and maybe start conversation or whatnot. But it's also, they pick the right people. Usually with these volumes, they pick the right people so that you get a lot of information. And like I said, the subject of a salt marsh or a marsh or a pond just in general is not going to date very much except ecological danger. The, the system of what makes a marsh and what keeps it alive and who populates it and what they do and what they eat there uh, it's not going to change from now until from then until now. So that well, one of the reasons that I love this book is because it still captures a lot of the ecology of the marsh system, uh, which has uh, marshes, ponds, wetlands, low lying wetlands of any kind tend to have. Uh, <laughs> I won't say tend. They tend to have uh, one particular person <laughs> involved, and that particular person gets. Oh, see, here's another another cycle. Just wonderful. This book is full of of cycles like that that show you uh, all the different things that can happen when the water uh, fills with oxygen and becomes extremely profuse. <laughs> uh, if they, look at that. A nice sapiotone picture of uh, a marsh deer. Weird thing, this is from 1966, that all of these animals are long dead. There's another classic example there. Usually in a marsh, of the marshes that I tend to like, that I tended to like, the main problem was not crocodilians, because I wouldn't go anywhere near, and I certainly wouldn't bring my dogs anywhere near a body of water, not knowingly, bring my, my dogs anywhere near a body of water that, uh, that might have a crocodilian in it. That, that just wouldn't happen. But... Uh, so so when I went to these to these places and tramped all over them, the main uh, problem that I had was snapping turtles. If you don't, you might not be familiar. Maybe you've never maybe you've never met a snapping turtle. They are they can be monstrous. They usually don't want any trouble. They don't they don't they want you to be left alone. Uh, but if you encounter one that doesn't, they can be short tempered and they can travel. They can move when they want to and. That's no small thing. You you definitely don't want to be wading around in mucky, muddy water if you think there's a chance of a snapping turtle there. Because if you get bit by the beak of a 30-pound bad-tempered snapping turtle, you might lose the thing it bites. You might lose the limb. It certainly wouldn't be anything you could laugh off. You couldn't stay camping. You would have to seek help. Uh, but that didn't usually happen. They're pretty reclusive. No, the thing that... the 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 life form that is almost certainly going to be determinative in an area like this is beaver. <laughs> Beavers make ponds. They make wetlands. They radically alter marshes, especially if there's a running current somewhere. They are uh, landscape engineers, extremely advanced landscape engineers. They build dams and also lodges, and these affect the whole area of where they are. Nearing doesn't go into much detail, on them, you get a you get a, a beaver dam there and a lodge in the background. You've got a that's uh, that's a muskrat, not a beaver, and mentions that they're very agile in land and on water, uh, and mentions also that muskrats also build a lot. Nothing nothing close to what beavers do. I have a feeling I I always want in this book whenever I go back to I go back to this a lot because I'm never going to walk. I'm never going to camp or canoe in a salt marsh again. That's never going to happen. I'm going to have to live now through books that I have. I have a few on salt marshes. But whenever I re revisit this book, I always wish that, that there were more about beavers. They are so determinative in so many of the places, of the kinds of places that Nearing writes about here. I think the reason why that we don't get more about them is because he didn't like them. They're not particularly likable. <laughs> beavers aren't. And when you meet them, they're not particularly likable. They're grinds. 
they're not really interested in you. Uh, and maybe, maybe they have some sort of deep cultural memory of hating humans because humans almost drove them to extinction on every continent that, where they occur. They were almost driven to extinction in the 19th century. It's almost a question where in the North American beaver we're talking about there might be a, a captive production you know, a population somewhere here or there like the North American bison, but that in the wild they're gone. So <laughs> if, if they remember that or teach their young that, then they have reason to be resentful of humans. You, if you're out and about, in marshland, I can almost guarantee that that marshland has been built or is being sustained by beavers. But if you're out and about during the day, it's almost certain you won't see them. They don't want to see you. They don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> I have seen them because I have paddled waters like this everywhere. Slowly, taking my time. I wasn't in any hurry. Uh, provided my dogs were asleep or behaving themselves, <laughs> which usually meant the same thing, uh, then I could just glide for a long, long time, or just sit there. Just sit there on the water and watch what happens when you're not making noises anymore, when you don't smell or, or sound or look like a human. The world starts to reassert itself when you do that. Uh, if, I, if you're not in a huge human-style hurry to get from point A to point B, when I did this, when I explored these kinds of worlds, I wasn't. Uh, see, there you have a, a pond that has silted up completely. Look at that. Uh, this, the, what, the joy of these kinds of books, these were done, uh, this whole series was done, I believe, in cooperation with the U.S. Department of the Interior. So there was money behind the series. I'm a little bit astonished that I don't see it, that I don't see the series when I'm out and about. I, I never see these in the wild. I've never seen another copy of this. I've never seen an, another copy of any of the other volumes in this series. Uh, and all same thing with, with uh, the Time Life books. I almost never see them. Maybe they have sentimental value, or maybe they're all gone. Maybe, I mean, they're all from the 1960s and early 1970s. Maybe in the 1980s, 1990s, they just were yard sailed out of existence. Uh, but I don't know that I'd, I don't know that I would reconstitute the whole set of this. Uh, quite a few of, of the volumes in this set, whether it be seasides or forests or whatnot, uh, are outdated, badly outdated. This is not. Marshes are still marshes. You can still, they're still amazing places to explore. Provided you go prepared, <laughs> but uh, but this is this is absolutely essential. I don't I don't I have other books on salt marshes and on marshes and ponds just in general, but this is the one I go back to, par probably partly for sentimental reasons because I've been going back to it for well <laughs> fifty years, so, so that's a long time. Uh, that that is certainly a good yardstick for what makes a bookshelf essential. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that it's content. It could be that it's just essential to you. This is a little bit of both. Nearing is really good on pond environments. <laughs> he would have been anyway if he'd been writing the book on his own or whether he's getting a fat $50,000 check from the Department of the Interior. He would still have been good. So this is nostalgia and information. <laughs> but anyway, that's my essential, my bookshelf essential for today, the life of the marsh. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Uh, I'll wrap this one up and I'll do another bookshelf essential soon. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.